Hello, I'm Jen Beer. I'm the Health Improvement Lead for Children and Young People in the Public Health Team at Hertfordshire County Council. Public Health coordinates something called the Just Talk campaign, which is a positive mental health and wellbeing campaign for children and young people, and it involves over 35 partners from across Hertfordshire working together so that we can support families around mental health and wellbeing as best we can. The topic of the webinar today is around boys and men's mental health and wellbeing. This is part of our Just Talk week, which takes place in November every year. It's really important to remember that when we talk about boys and men's mental health, we'll be generalising a lot. Every single person is different and everyone will experience mental health and wellbeing differently. So please understand that the information within this webinar is very much based on generalisation taken from data and statistics. Hope you find it helpful. Mental illness can be more common than people think, and actually mental illness can affect absolutely anyone. But some mental illnesses can be more common in some groups than in others, and it can be helpful to be aware of this. Emotional disorders, so that includes depression, anxiety and bipolar affective disorder, are the most common type of mental illness, affecting 1 in 12 5 to 19 year olds. In most age groups, these are more common in girls than boys. So, for example, within the 17 to 19 year old age group, 8% of boys have an emotional disorder and 22% of girls. The rates, particularly for girls, are much lower, though, in younger age groups. So 11% of girls in the 11 to 16 year old age group will have an emotional disorder. That's half the number seen in that older age group. For boys, the rate is also lower in the 11 to 16 age group, but only slightly. Now, behavioural disorders, although less common than emotional disorders, are more likely to be diagnosed in boys than in girls. The most common age for behavioural disorders to be diagnosed is between 11 and 16. And behavioural disorders are generally only diagnosed in children and young people. Examples of behavioural disorders include conduct disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. While only some of us will be affected by mental illness directly, we all have mental health. We all have a head, we all have a brain, so we all have mental health. Here we have a definition from Dr. Lynn Friedley, which really well expresses how much mental health influences every aspect of our life. So she says, mental health influences how we think and feel about ourselves and others and how we interpret events. It affects how capacity to learn, to communicate and to form, sustain and end relationships. It also influences our ability to cope with change, transition and life events. I think it really well sums up the importance of, for all of us in looking after our mental health and well-being because it affects every aspect of our lives. What you can see on your screen now is something called the mental health continuum. Mental health used to be viewed as sitting on a straight line. You either have good mental health or bad mental health. You're either mentally ill or you're well. We now know that it's actually more complex than this. And that also things can change over time. For example, someone with a diagnosed mental illness, such as anxiety, who is receiving support and has developed some good self-help strategies on a day-to-day -day basis will often have a good sense of well-being. Equally, someone who has no mental illness, but who is having a really bad day, perhaps work is overwhelming them, perhaps they've fallen out with a friend who's important to them, they may feel quite low in themselves and actually have a worse sense of well-being. The point to remember is that everyone can increase their sense of well-being, whether they have a mental illness or not, through support and through self-help techniques. So why is it important for us to engage with boys about mental health and well-being? Well, there's a few reasons, really, and I'll just touch upon some of those now. Firstly, boys and men are less likely to seek support, particularly in relation to their mental health and well-being. Boys and men are also more likely to only access support when they're actually at crisis point, so when they're in a really bad way. We also know that current mental health messages don't resonate as well with boys as they do with girls. Quite often, for example, if you organise a focus group or something to design a mental health campaign, what you'll find is that more females come forward, and that means that that mental health campaign is more based on their experience than the experience of boys. We also know that boys are at an increased risk of taking their own lives. One life lost is too many. 
So it's so important that we find a way to engage your boys to make sure that they don't ever reach that point of crisis where they start to think about taking their own lives. It's important that we also consider why these differences exist. So one of the reasons will probably be down to cultural differences. We know that in society and in the media, boys are regularly told to man up and toughen up. And this can be incredibly uh, detrimental in terms of them coming forward and speaking about how they feel. We also know that mental distress in boys can be misinterpreted as naughtiness or bad behaviour. And what this means is that they either might not be diagnosed with a mental illness when they actually have one, or that they receive a sort of punishment or judgment rather than support and help. As I mentioned earlier, when we consult on mental health campaigns, girls are much more likely to contribute. So we end up with campaigns that are much more relevant to them, which leads boys to disengage and not really feel that what they're hearing is uh, relevant to them. And it's often the female role models in a boy's life that takes a leading role in conversations about mental health and well-being. What happens here is that this then normalises talking about mental health as being a female trait. Obviously, it's really important that um, female role models do remain talking about mental health and well-being, but we also need boys and men to do the same so that it's seen as something that's acceptable for all. All of us in life will have different coping strategies that we use at challenging times. Some of us will have a huge range of coping strategies that we can draw on, but other people really struggle to find ways to boost their well-being and to know what to do when challenges hit. In Hertfordshire, we have an annual survey. Last year, this was completed by just under 13,000 young people. And this told us that many children of any gender find things like playing or listening to music a really useful coping strategy. Also, generally, people find talking to friends and family helpful. The survey results also, though, tell us that boys particularly find sports and physical activity, technology and video games very useful coping strategies. Of course, anyone can find these coping strategies helpful, but they're more often identified by boys as something they find really useful. Another thing we know is that boys are more likely than girls to want to talk to a family member in order to cope with difficult times, where girls are generally more likely to want to talk to a friend. Concerningly, a significant number of young people cannot identify any coping strategies when they're asked, and this can put a young person at serious risk. We generally think that the more challenges a young person has faced, the more at risk they may be. But if a young person hasn't faced many challenges in their lives, this can actually also put them at risk, as they may not have naturally developed ways to effectively handle problems. It's also important for people to have more than one coping strategy. If, for example, someone always uses running as a way to handle stress, to clear their head, to feel calmer, if they then become injured, their mood will significantly plummet. This is why it's so important that we all develop a range of coping strategies we can draw on at different times and that we practice those coping strategies and work out what works best for us. A number of years ago now, a huge piece of research was undertaken internationally to look at what really works to boost our well-being. From this came a model called the Five Ways to Wellbeing. And this is five key evidence-based ways for us all to be able to boost how we feel, boost our sense of well-being, our happiness. One of the five ways to well-being is notice. Some potential strategies you can use to notice are breathing techniques, mindfulness and meditation, listening to music, taking a walk in nature, writing a list of things you're grateful for in your life. The idea of taking notice is that you're focusing on the moment. You're not thinking about the past. You're not worrying about the future. You're using a strategy that brings you into the immediate moment, which can be very calming. Another of the five ways to well-being is to be active. So physical activity has for a long time been linked very closely with good mental health. And there are lots of different ways to be active. It doesn't have to be sport. It doesn't have to be competitive. Team games and sport can certainly be one thing, but also individual focused activities, things like running, swimming and cycling, dancing. And in terms of boys, there are so many different dance forms now that different people can get involved in. Play for younger children. Play is absolutely key. Opportunities to explore and play and use imagination, so important. And also things like housework and gardening are a really good way to be active, but also to be helpful. 
Another of the five ways to well-being is to connect. And this is so important. Spending time with people that make you feel good about yourself. And that's really key because spending time with some people does not give us the same boost that spending time with other people gives us. So it's about recognising how different people make you feel. Another potential strategy is to contact someone you haven't spoken to for a while, reconnecting with someone. Writing a letter to an older relative potentially to let them know you're thinking of them can be a fantastic way to connect. Gaming with friends, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of boys identify gaming as a really important coping strategy. And joining a group or a club to meet new people, again, a great way to connect. Another thing that the evidence tells us um, helps to boost our well-being is to learn new things, to learn about something. Obviously, children and young people are learning all of the time at school and through their education. However, what really gives them a particular boost to their well-being is learning something because they're choosing to learn about it. So learning about a new word or a fact, learning a new skill, so something like computer programming, graphic design, making short films, photography, anything at all that interests them taking up a new hobby as well, doing some research into something that interests them. Maybe they're interested in a particular animal or a country or a culture and reading books as well. Fantastic ways to absorb new information and feel that you're growing. The last of the five ways to well-being is to give. We often talk about the importance of kindness, and this is similar. Kindness to others, but also kindness to ourselves. And the research tells us that if we do give, if we are kind, then we're more likely to get a boost to our own well-being. Some of the things you can do are volunteering, so giving your time to someone to help, giving or raising money for charity, paying someone a compliment. So it's not just the big things, but actually small things as well can make a huge difference to your well-being and to the well-being of others. So it could be something as small as giving someone a smile as you walk past them giving someone a hug when you know they're having a bad day. Other things you could do, things like helping with the housework, helping someone who's in a difficult situation, helping a friend, someone who's struggling a little bit or just again having a bad day. So that's the five ways to wellbeing. If you have a look at the link on the slide, there's actually some free five ways to wellbeing e-learning available for primary and secondary age children and young people. And what that e-learning does is it helps children and young people to explore what might work well for them in terms of um, boosting their well-being. So there are also some other ways that we can all help to support boys and young men with their mental health. As I mentioned earlier, avoiding phrases like man up and toughen up is really important as this can make it difficult for someone to talk about how they're feeling. They can fear that they'll appear weak. And mental health problems are not a weakness. Talking about them should be encouraged. It's a sign of strength to talk. Also, another really important thing that we can do as adults is to role model that it's OK to talk by admitting ourselves that sometimes we struggle and need a bit of help. Um, this shows our child that it's OK to reach out. It's also really important to just keep an eye out for any potential warning signs um, that might indicate um, a young person is struggling with their mental health. So some of the typical ones might be a change to their usual character, things like irritability, anger and sensitivity to criticism. Also, physical pain sometimes can be a sign of um, mental ill health. So if someone is regularly complaining of headaches or backaches with no obvious cause or sign of recovery, it could be a symptom of mental ill health. Stomach aches as well, another common one. Parents and carers regularly talk to me about the fact that Sometimes they just don't know how to get their child to talk. Um, and it's really difficult because we can't force someone to talk. Um, but phrases like, I'm ready to listen when you're feeling ready to talk, let me know if and when you'd like to talk can be really helpful. It just lets um, your child know that if they need to speak to you, you're there and you're willing. It's also helpful to use ordinary situations at home as opportunities to have a non-direct conversation to start with. So when you're walking the dog together or doing the washing up or cooking dinner together. A lot of people find it helpful when they're driving in a car side by side. There's something slightly less intimidating about having a conversation when you're not facing each other sometimes. And you can ask open questions, things like, how are things going? What was your day like? 
You may have heard of the presenter Ian Lee, who was on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here a few years ago, and he's done various things on TV, radio, and currently on Twitch. Um, Ian Lee talks very openly about mental health and well-being, and he was kind enough to speak to us um, within the public health team about the work we're doing to promote good mental health in children and young people. And he gave us some really useful advice that he uses to keep an eye on the well-being of his own sons. He said, I tell my boys, if you ever get so sad that you can feel it, then you need to talk to someone, whether it's your brother or your mum or me, a teacher, a friend at school, talk about it. I was never told that at eight. My dad was very much an internalising person to his detriment. His life was a mess because of that. The fact that we can now have these conversations with our children in an age appropriate way, we're planting the seeds that this next generation will be more open. I think these words are really important because it shows the importance of our young person, our child being able to speak to somebody. Fundamentally, it doesn't matter really who the young person speaks to, as long as they feel that they can speak to someone, as long as they have that relationship with someone in their lives. And everyone's different. So for some people, it will be easier to talk to a teacher. And for some people, it will be easier to talk to a parent. It's really important that we just instill in our children that talking is what's important. It can also be really helpful to make your child aware of the support and information that's available to them should they ever need it. One of the central places we have in Hertfordshire to contain information about mental health and wellbeing is www.justtalkhearts.org. On there you can find a range of e-learning, posters, short videos, all sorts of things for young people, parents and professionals. You'll also find a list of the different types of support that's available. So there's online support, text messaging support, face-to-face, -face, telephone support. So a huge different um, range of things that young people can access. Another really useful website is the Health for Teens website, which is run by our school nursing service. And that contains information on a range of different health topics, including mental health. The Young Minds website is a fantastic website as well. They're a national charity and they have loads of information for young people, but also specifically a huge amount of information for parents and a parent helpline as well that you can call. That's really helpful if you have um, a child with a mental illness, for example, and you have any questions that you want to ask. There's also free e-learning for parents and carers at MindEd, uh, a huge range of different modules that you can do from sort of promoting well-being to finding out more about specific illnesses. So what have we covered in this session? Firstly, we've covered that we all have mental health. Absolutely every single one of us has mental health and that can shift and change over time. Anyone can develop a mental illness, although it is more likely in some groups than in others. We've also talked about how boys are less likely to talk openly about their mental health or ask for help and that this can potentially place them at risk. However, there are things we can do to support boys to be more likely to talk about how they feel and to feel more comfortable accessing help. We've also covered that there are a range of self-help techniques that can help anyone to boost their well-being. And the important thing is to practice these self-help techniques to explore what works well for you. Finally, we've highlighted that there's a wide range of information and resources available on www.justtalkhearts.org for young people, parents and professionals. And from that website, we will link you to a wide range of different services, different useful websites, and we keep updating that all the time. So hopefully you'll find that a really useful resource. Thanks so much for listening. I'll leave you now on this final slide which summarises what the Just Talk campaign in Hertfordshire is all about. You'll also see our social media accounts on there, so do feel free to give us a follow. We regularly share useful mental health and wellbeing tips and tricks and opportunities to access training, things like that. Thanks very much.